والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Living in the West. In these episodes of Living in the West, we're looking into the lives of the Muslims who are living in the West. And some of the Muslims who live in the West and the minorities in the West, how they are supposed to live, what interaction they're supposed to have. Is it permissible for them to live there? The classifications of them living there, a very important topic. And with me, I have Sheikh Haytham Al Haddad from the Muslim Research and Development Foundation. Uh, from the UK, a think tank, an organization helping those Muslims in the West to find solutions to their problems. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, in previous episodes, we've spoken uh, about the Muslims and how we classify uh, certain lands that belong to the Muslims or don't belong to the Muslims, and you give uh, uh, some explanation. Can you give us a, a concise summary of what these classifications were, Sheikh? Okay. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. In summary, we said that we have to look at the consequences of the classification before dwelling into the classification itself. And we said that all the فقهاء, almost all of them, have classified the land or the globe into two main classifications: دار الإسلام and دار الكفر. And Dar al-Islam mainly is the land that is controlled by the law of al-Islam, where al-Islam is giving the superiority over any other law. Dar al-Kufr is the land that does not give this superiority uh, to al-Islam. This is the two main classifications. And in this Dar al-Kufr, for example, there are more clarifications need to be made, actually. You, you spoke about Dar al-Harb. Okay. okay. Uh, what do we mean by Dar al-Harb? Because this is one of, them, one of the classifications. Yeah. This notion, Dar al-Harb, mm. has been heavily used mm. by many people now, mm. including maybe some of the groups, certain groups and uh, certain young people, uh, this issue of Dar al-Harb. So maybe it is important to, uh, classify, to, to clarify it a little bit. It's quite a hot topic. Basically. Yes, it's a very hot topic, mm. yes. Dar al-Harb, the fuqaha, the jurists and the scholars, they classified Dar al-Kufr into mainly two types. Mm -hmm. The first type is Dar al-Harb, and the second type is Dar al-Ahd. Dar al-Kufr means the land that has waged war against Muslim or in a state of war with Muslims. Okay? Or to be pr more precise, with the Islamic State. Dar al-Ahd is the land that has been in a state of war with Muslims, but it is now have a covenant or an agreement, a treaty with Muslims. So the harb is not at the moment on the pause. And the, during that pause, because of this treaty, this land is classified as Daru al-Ahd, the covenant abode or the abode of covenant. Now, maybe uh, you know of, you have heard that the Hanafi jurists, they don't have this classification, Dar al-Harb and Dar, uh, sorry, they don't have the classification of Dar al-Kufr into Dar al-Harb and Dar al-Ahd. They consider Dar al-Kufr is equivalent to Dar al-Harb. And this is uh, quite important because you remember when we said that some Hanafi jurists considered the land where Muslims feel secure mm -hmm. as the land of Al-Islam, and we, some thinkers take this, quote this from the Hanafis, and they said that European countries are considered to be or can be considered as Dar al-Islam. Mm -hmm. We have to, uh, we need to tell them that you have to consider the other a classification of the Hanafis, and you have to look at it, because the Hanafis, they don't differentiate between Dar al-Harb and Dar al-Kufr. So they don't say that Dar al-Kufr is classified into Dar al-Harb and Dar al-Ahd. They consider Dar al-Kufr is equivalent to Dar al-Harb. What about Dar al-Ahd? Do uh, the Hanafi scholars uh, neglect 
the fact that there might be a treaty between the Muslims and the Darul Kufr, mm -hmm. whereby there is no war between them. They don't neglect this, but they say even if there is a treaty between the Muslims and the non-Muslims, still the land governed by the non-Muslims and governed by the non-Islamic laws uh, is considered to be Darul Harb, although it is uh, in a state of agreement or a treaty with Muslims. Can you give some explanation in terms of examples? I mean, for example, the time of the Quraysh and Hudaybiyah. I mean, would this be a classification that could be used? Yeah, yeah. For the, the, the Hanafis, they still call that Dar, mm -hmm. although it has a treaty like the Quraysh, they consider it as Darul Harb. Mm -hmm. And this is what many people who caught the Hanafis, they try to ignore or overcome this reality. Mm -hmm. And that's why we tell them, no, if you are quoting Hanafis, you have to be precise in quoting Hanafis, and you have to mention this. And you cannot just um, eliminate this. It's like or picking you and choosing, not uh, taking uh, the whole ruling. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And if we are talking, if this discourse is an academic discourse, then we have to bring everything into perspective because the Hanafis, all of the Hanafi scholars have mentioned this. And the Hanafi school of thought is one of the well-established school of thought, many Muslims. Actually, some people say most of the Muslims are following the Hanafi school of thought. Yes. And we are benefiting from the legacy of the Hanafi scholars. All of us, all the whole Muslim world is benefiting from the legacy of Abu Hanifa, etc. So we, we have to quote the Hanafi a school of thought accurately. Mm -hmm. And we have to mention this thing. Now, whether we accept it, we, we don't accept it, this is something else. But we have to quote it correctly. Now, the, the, the Hanafis, as we said, they don't classify Darul Kufr into Darul Harb and Darul Ahd. As we said, they classify Darul Kufr or they equate between Darul Kufr and Dar Al Harb. This is very important because once we discuss the issue of the permissibility of riba in non-Muslim land, all those who claim that it is allowed to deal with riba, okay, or to deal in riba in non-Muslim land, they caught who? They caught the Hanafi scholars. And this is very, very problematic. Because if you are quoting the Hanafis, it means that you are implicitly accepting their notion that this land is Dar al Harb. No, you know, you, you've, you've said this now, and, and it's very interesting because I think we, we need an explanation to say, well, what are the consequences of accept, accepting that this land is Dar al What are the consequences? Exactly. What do we need to make clear that's obligatory upon the Muslim when he accepts this consequence? Okay. Now, this, uh, this point that you have mentioned is a very crucial point. Mm -hmm. Now, once we say that it is Dar al Harb, Many people and many groups, they fall into this trap. And it is good. We don't want to hide things. We mm. want to explain things. Once they uh, consider this land as Dar al Harb, then all consequences mm -hmm. of Dar al Harb okay, are, consider are considered, according to them, inevitable. Means, okay, Dar, Dar al Harb, we are allowed to maybe kill. Mm. We are allowed to rob the people's money, we are allowed to steal, we are allowed to even not to implement other parts of Al-Islam, even if we are living there. And that is totally wrong. And because of this connection that some people have established, the other thinkers who don't want this to happen, they came to this notion or to this classification and they said, we don't need to be bound by this classification, let us just discard it and look for another classification. And this approach is wrong because this approach has been established in our books of al-fiqh. We cannot discard it, but we have to understand it correctly. And this is, what, this is where many of the contemporary thinkers went wrong. Mm -hmm. They discarded this classification in order to bring their own classification which will not be accepted because it is not supported nor by the Quran by, or the Sunnah nor it is supported by what the Fuqaha 
There's no lineage to, to this. To this to yes, yes. Uh, stated. Mm. But if they say, okay, if you classify the Darul Kufr, or if you classify the abode, the globe, into two abodes, Darul Islam and Darul Harb, means Darul Harb, you are allowed to kill, you are allowed to steal, and you are not allowed to leave some ahkam of Sharia in that. We say no. Who said that? Once we say that this is Darul Harb, then the consequence or these consequences are inevitable. No. This has to be clarified. It might be Darul Harb, mm -hmm. but still, okay, we do not implement all the rulings that the Fuqaha mentioned about Darul Harb, such as, okay, that the, the Harbis, okay, the Harbis have no uh, sanctity. Of, uh, uh, for their wealth and their life, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, why? Because they are considering them harbis. People that they're fighting against, basically. Yes, the, the, yes. okay. B people are fighting against Islam. But we say, in Darul Harb, in Darul Harb, from a classical point of view, when the Muslim country sends some messengers to Darul Harb to negotiate something, although it is classified as Darul Harb, those messengers, when they go to that land, they are not allowed to steal, they are not allowed to uh, to kill, and they have to finish their mission and come back, and they are not allowed to portray those. Uh, uh, they are not allowed to betray those people living in Darul Harb or the Harbis, although it is classified as Darul Harb. Okay, we're going to uh, look into these classifications uh, a bit deeply just after this short break. Please do stay with us on Living in the West. <laughs> Hey everyone, check this out. If you are confused or surprised or a little astonished or maybe you have questions about life or the hereafter or maybe you need some help. What about someone you can really trust? Someone reliable? Feel free to Ask Huda. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Living in the West. We're speaking about the classifications of Dar Harb, Sheikh. Uh, could you just carry on with this classification and just bring it to a brief, uh, concise summary? Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. What we were saying is that Darul Harb or Darul Kufr is classified mainly into two classifications. And this is the, the, the Darul, land of war we're saying. The now. land of war. Okay. Okay. To, um, uh, no, Darul Kufr is classified into two main classifications, land of war and land of covenant. Okay. And we said that the very big mistake that many people fell into is considering Darul Harb as the abode where Muslims uh, having war with and they build all the consequences. So basically they make it uh, out as the extreme case scenario or should we say what they're totally allowed to do. For example, yes, yes, if they're at war exactly. they're allowed to take from the people, they're allowed to take them. Just to steal, steal maybe and kill, and kill, kill, even take This is in, in, in a war scenario. Possess. Yes. Okay. But we are saying now that this is not totally true in some cases of Dar Harb. Exactly. Exactly. Because there are the messengers, etc. Uh -huh. etc. Okay. But apart from that, they say Dar al Ahd is the land that has a treaty with Muslims. So now can, can, I, can I give an example? Uh, are you saying like uh, after the Hudaybiyah, for example? After the Hudaybiyah. There was a treaty between the Muslims and the Quraysh. Exactly. The Hudaybiyah was a treaty between okay. Muslims and Darul Kufr at that time. And after that, okay, mm. there were, were peace, a temporary peace, peace mm. at that time. So Mecca at that time 
is best to be classified as Darul Ahd, mm. and Muslims were allowed to go to perform Umrah, etc. So now, because of the new world order, most Muslim countries have the treaties with most of the uh, Darul Kufr, or most of the non-Muslim countries. The classifications of those so countries. So there, yeah. there is kind of a treaty. Now, we don't want to get into the discussion with this treaty is legitimate or it is not legitimate. But even if we say that this treaty is illegitimate, mm -hmm. who is allowed to break it? And this is one of the big mistakes of some of these groups because they put themselves in charge for the Ummah to break these treaties. And even if you say that these uh, treaties are illegitimate treaties, it is not for individuals so, so to I, break these uh, treaties. So I can't uh, tomorrow do an, uh, a certain act or say a certain statement speaking on the behalf of the Ummah without the permission. Basically. Exactly, exactly. And exactly. saying even if you done. don't, that's why, see, from our Islamic heritage, mm -hmm. uh, if the ruler, of the, if the Muslim ruler is not implementing the penal code, the scholars, most of them, they say that it is not allowed for the individuals to implement those penal codes just directly. Why? Because to implement a penal code, for example, chopping the hand of the thief, there has to be some conditions. Is that true or not? Yes. Who is going to verify whether these conditions have been fulfilled before applying the had? It is what? It is the system. So there's going to be anarchy. Everybody's going to apply it exactly. as a CEO. And everyone, based on his ijtihad, this is the big mistake that many people fell into, and we have to be careful. And we are talking openly here. We are not hiding anything. This, many people fell into this mistake. My ijtihad that this is a thief, I have to cut his hand. Later on, his ijtihad will consider someone else as a thief, and he has to cut his hand. A group of people, they might have their ijtihad that, well, X country of the non-Muslim countries have broken their treaty with the Muslims and therefore it is Darul Harb and we have to wage war against them. But who gave you this authority? Don't link between the illegit uh, illegitimate contract that has been established between some Muslim countries and some non-Muslim countries as a basis for you to take over the opinion of all Muslims as if you are the Khalifa of them. This, as you said, it will be anarchy because every group of people will, be, will use their ijtihad as a basis for their, own, uh, for their own actions. And we have to be careful of that. And so in a nutshell, we say that many Muslim can, many non-Muslim countries have kind of agreements with many non-Muslim or with many Muslim countries. So this, there is an element of Ahd. There is an element of covenant between those non-Muslim countries and those uh, Muslim countries. This is one thing. Mm -hmm. It is true that some non-Muslim countries are waging war against yes. some Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, the inhabitants of those Muslim countries are looking at this country as Darul Har because it is waging war against them. Similarly, this non-Muslim country and the inhabitants of that non-Muslim country will look at those Muslims as Harbi people. And by the way, this Darul Har, uh, sorry, Dar, uh, yeah, the the land of war is a terminology that has been recently used by some non-Muslim thinkers, talking about the lands that are in a state of war or that uh, in a state of wars against um, the, their countries. So, in a nutshell, this covenant, this agreement, have to be taken into consideration. So, we may say that many of those non-Muslim countries are considered to be Dar al-Ahd because of the agreement that have been established between them and many of the non-Muslim, uh, of many of the Muslim countries. But here I would like to highlight one other important issue, okay, which might, which might be the conclusion for this discussion. We are talking about living in the West. We are talking about Muslims living in the West. Those Muslims who are living in the West, 
they have a different perspective because different perspective from the the other Muslims living in Muslim countries. Why? Because there is a special agreement between them and their countries when they entered those countries, okay? When they entered those countries by uh, legitimate reasons, okay? Through legitimate reasons such as getting a visa from those countries. And, and, and if we're going to finish this, this subject, um, these legitimate agreements you're talking about, these, are these tacit approvals? Because Th these are tacit approvals, okay, and therefore those Muslims living in those countries have special agreement with the governments of those countries. Now, if we want to get into a deeper discussion, you might say, or someone might say, yes, we agree that there is an agreement between the governments or many governments of European countries and the Muslims living in those governments, but there are some European governments or some Dar al Kufr governments or some non Muslim government, governments that have broken their agreements with Muslims many times, so they don't have any kind of covenant. Mm -hmm. They don't have any kind of uh, sanctity, okay, you can uh, say. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in this case, what are we going to say? Are we going to say that, that the, the treaty has been broken? between them or what? We say, even if the agreement has been broken between the individuals, mm -hmm. the Muslims and the government, but there is a social agreement, social contract between the Muslims living in any of those European or non-Muslim countries. This social contract, maybe the uh, Thomas Hobbes, the mm -hmm. famous thinker in the 17th century, mm -hmm. uh, he introduced this uh, social contract concept and many p other people have mentioned it. But from the Islamic perspective, this social contract has been established way before Thomas Hobbes and other thinkers. What is this social contract? Mm -hmm. okay. What is known by custom, custom. is considered to be or takes the uh, power of what has been clearly agreed, okay, in a contract. It is not a written contract, but it is what? A known contract. It is like the social contract. So Muslims living in non-Muslim countries, whether you classify these Muslim countries, Dar al-Kufr, Dar al-Ahd, Dar al har they have a social contract between them and the people living in these countries. Therefore, they should look at themselves from this angle and they are not allowed to steal the people, they are not allowed to, to um, uh, do all um, things that the people have looked at them as trusted people. Okay, but, but somebody may see this scenario she can say uh, this is all and well but the ummah is uh, one body for example um, there's affliction going on everywhere how fast how do we hold fast to these rules of uh, say this ahd uh, even when we see this infliction this is the one of the major questions we see an infliction uh, by people who we see clearly breaking treaties how do we as a group of people now accept this and uh, it's, a, it's a quite a, a strong argument yeah. Um, I don't know whether we have time to discuss this argument, okay, mm -hmm. because this is a quite long art uh, mm -hmm. argument and it is an important one, mm -hmm. okay. Um, but I want to clarify more the point. Mm -hmm. I said that individuals living in non-Muslim countries have social contracts, have urfi contract between themselves and the other non-Muslim colleagues or the uh, non-Muslims citizens living in those countries. And they've accepted they've, that because this is a tacit, so they've accepted this by just being part of the system. Exactly. Uh, see, who accepted it? We have to be careful yes. because some people might uh, argue hmm. it is not the Muslims who accepted it because hmm. some Muslims might, hmm. and some of the young people, they might say, well, we haven't accepted yes. it. No. 
it is not you but the other non-muslims are the one who accepted it because they are looking at you as what they are not looking at you as a harbi as someone who is waging war against them they are looking at you as a trustworthy person living among them you are one of the citizen you see we have to be careful we are not talking about the hostility their hostility and uh, some uh, extreme parties looking at muslims that they are foreigners they have to be no. expelled etc yes they are looking at them from this angle some of those parties are looking at muslims from this angle but they are not looking at those muslims as if the muslims are uh, waging war against them and they are not trustworthy people okay so therefore this contract has to be monitored and witnessed whenever a muslim is uh, dealing with the other citizens living with him in that country we don't want to get into the discussion which is the relationship between the muslim and the government this is maybe well, another discussion and we will in, no, uh, I, think I, I prefer not to discuss it because of time constraints no no you've clarified this very well jazakallah khair Sheikh Sheikh Haytham Al Haddad from Muslim Research and Development uh, Foundation. Um, I see from what you're saying, Sheikh, it's very clear now. But to many of you, you may say that there's more questions to be answered. Well, we've got many more episodes of Living in the West. Please stay with us. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.